Welcome everyone. This is our last One Maryland, One Book author event tour, and I'm so thankful for everyone who's joining us today. I'm Lindsay Baker, Executive Director of Maryland Humanities. I'm going to go over some housekeeping items first, and then we'll do introductions. We want to let you know that this event is being recorded for further, for further viewing purposes. You will be able to view this event on the Maryland Humanities YouTube channel after the author tour is complete. If you have a question for our wonderful author, Ross Gay, use the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat to ask questions. We hope that the chat will be reserved for um, wonderful and wild conversations between attendees. With the Q&A function, you are able to view the questions that other attendees have asked. If you want to ask a question someone has already put in the Q&A, click the thumbs up under it to upvote that question. This will let the moderator know which questions are of the most interest to the audience during the Q&A later in the program. As you can see, we have a, an ASL interpreter with us today and captions are enabled. You should see the captions at the bottom of your screen. If you find the captions distracting, Click the button that says CC and you can turn them off. All right, let's get started. We're excited you could join us this afternoon. This event is one of more than 300 programs being held this fall as part of our One Maryland, One Book program, which we like to think of as Maryland's biggest book club. Since the beginning of One Maryland, One Book 14 years ago, the authors of our selected books have spoken at various locations around the state. This was not possible this year given the ongoing pandemic and our wish to err on the side of caution by not holding large indoor events at this time. We are proud to be able to bring the One Maryland One Book Author Tour to you virtually so we can also gather to hear Ross Gay speak. The level of enthusiasm for his collection of lyrical essays, The Book of Delights, highlights our collective interest in coming together during challenging times with the hope of connecting through our own experiences and the experiences of others. High school classes, book clubs, public libraries, senior centers, correctional facilities, and more have been participating in events inspired by the book across Maryland since September and planned to join up for more discussions and events this month into November. So it's really like a three month thing. We're really excited about it. At Maryland Humanities, we're passionate about making the humanities a part of everyday life. Programs like this one use the humanities to explore our ideas, our stories, and our values to foster understanding among people with diverse perspectives and to strengthen our ability to interact meaningfully. I invite you to take a moment to learn more about our nine other programs by visiting mdhumanities.org. And always don't forget, you can click on the donate button at the top of our website uh, and make a donation in honor of this program and our other programs. We are an educational nonprofit and it is people like you and your generosity that allows us to thrive and continue to offer over a thousand free programs statewide annually. I wanna take a brief moment to thank our co-hosts and partners, the Center for Literary Arts at Frost Bay, Frostburg State University. Additional support was provided by Allegheny Arts Council, Allegheny County Public Library, Lewis J. Ort Library, Office of the Provost and Main Street Books. The staff of Frostburg State University and their partners have put great effort into this afternoon's event. Special thanks to Jennifer Brown, who worked closely with our staff. And now I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Michael Mathias, interim provost, provo wow, can't say the word, interim provost of Frostburg State University, and our guest, Ross Gay. Uh, Dr. Mathias, or Mike, as he said to call him, serves as Interim Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Frostburg State University. He holds a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Rochester and has taught undergraduate and graduate courses in moral, political, and legal philosophy for two decades. Dr. Mathias previously served as Interim Associate Provost and as Chair of the Philosophy Department at Frostburg State University. Welcome, Mike. Ross Gay is the author of The Book of Delights, a genre-defined book of essays, and four books of poetry, including his most recent, Beholding, a love song to legendary basketball player, Julius Irving, known as Dr. J, who dominated courts in the 1970s and 80s as a small forward for the Philadelphia 76ers. Gay is a founding editor with Carissa Chen and Patrick Rosal of the online sports magazine, Some Call It Baller, 
a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit free fruit for all food justice and joy project. Gay has received fellowships from Cave Canem, the Bread Loaf Writers Conference and the Guggenheim Foundation. He teaches at Indiana University. In the Book of Delights, Gay offers up a volume of lyric essays written over one tumultuous year. The first nonfiction book from the award-winning poet is a record of the small joys we often overlook in our busy lives. Among Gay's funny, poetic, philosophical delights, a friend's unabashed use of air quotes, I was just listening to that one this morning, cradling a tomato seedling aboard an airplane, the silent nod of acknowledgement between the only two black people in a room. But Gay never dismisses the complexities, even the terrors of living in America as a black man or the ecological and psychic violence of our consumer culture or the loss of those he loves. More than any other, anything other subject though, Gay celebrates the beauty of the natural world. Yes, love it. His garden, the flowers peeking out of the sidewalk, the hypnotic movements of a praying mantis. And with that, I will toss it over to Ross. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and thank you, everyone. You know, Maryland One Book and the um, Maryland Humanities and all that. It's just, um, we were talking a little bit before this started, we got started today and um, it's just been so fun. I mean, it's we started on Sunday, it was the first event. And then it's been like two or three on Monday and then Tuesday and this is the last event. Um, and it's sweet, you know, even the even though we're not like physically in space together, I feel like I've made friends. Um, so anyway, I just want to say I'm really grateful to you all for um, um, choosing the book. And I'm also grateful to, um, you know, anyone who's read the book. It's a, it's a kind of it's a weird, lucky thing to, to be able to share share work. Um, maybe particularly when it's like you're sharing what you love, <laughs> you know? So anyway, this, this book, um, for those of you who haven't read it, it's called The Book of Delights. And the way that the book came to be, um, what I was, I was, I've told this story a handful of times this week, maybe every time I've read, is that I was having a really lovely day. Um, I'm looking out the window periodically just to see if it's raining because I want to get in a little basketball later today. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, but anyway, the, it came to pass because I was having, I was at what's called an artist retreat. And an artist retreat is a, you know, a gathering of artists where often they, they put you up and they feed you. And so this one happened to be in, in Umbria in, um, in Italy, um, a town called Umbertide. And they put us up in a literal castle um, and, you know, and it was beautiful and there were like sunflower seeds all over the place. And I guess in that part of Italy, like fennel just like grows on the side of the road and, um, you know, it was on and on and on. There were plum trees, volunteer plum trees and everything else. And I was walking home from the town where, you know, it's like a sweet little town where there was a little bakery that I would get um bread at sometimes or slice a slice um and i was walking home up up the hill kind of through the through the woods and then up through a couple of farm fields this trail um up to the castle the back way the back way to the castle and i was so kind of in the midst of delight i was i it was it occurred to me oh you're delighted right now <laughs> That I thought, oh, I should write a little essay about this, about this experience of delight. And then I thought, oh, I should write an essay every day for it. I didn't think it, it was thought for me. This feels very important that I, it was thought for me that I should write an essay every day for a year about something that delighted me. And um, that's what this book is. So, and it's dated because I gave myself three constraints, write them every day. So there's a date on all of these. Um, write them by hand. Um, so I wrote them all by hand in a notebook, usually with Le Pen's, this kind of pen, which I still love, my favorite pen. And um, write them quickly. So I gave myself, I put a timer on 30 minutes. Um, <clears throat> so that's part of the, we'll probably talk about that later. Um, but I'm just going to read 
around this time, it's October 6th. I'm gonna read basically around the time that we are, but this is gonna be October, in October of 2016. House Party. I'm referencing a movie called House Party that, you know, some of you may know, some of your parents may know. I'm reading Adam Kirsch's review of Ben Lerner's book, The Hatred of Poetry. It's evidently in the tradition of the many books that attempt to reveal the true reasons behind poetry's alleged plummet into disfavor. I was given the review, Xerox by a guy named Milt, who ran around the halls of Caltech as a kid and knew Linus Pauling. And I grilled him about that. I happened to be in the middle of a vitamin C detox, or I mean, I was detoxing by way of consuming thousands of milligrams of vitamin C daily, which I hope isn't toxic. It's not. The cold passed quick, FYI. Milt introduced me to the retirement community where I read poems today to about 40 folks or so, nearly all of them awake, and as lovely and engaged an audience as I've ever had. The place, like so many retirement communities, has gardens in the name. It shares that nomenclatural distinction with housing projects and some gardens. Milt had a theory that the hatred of poetry had something to do with the New Yorker, which he thought was also killing it. Poetry, I mean. The New Yorker was killing poetry, he thought, but not the hatred of it, unfortunately. It was a hatred of poetry garden, Milt thought. I thought he was giving the New Yorker too much credit, <laughs> but Milt's not the only person so opinioned about the New Yorker or the hatred of poetry or the garden of the hatred of poetry, adjacent to the garden of the death of poetry, just beyond the garden of the uselessness of poetry, hence Lerner's book about poetry or the hatred of it, selling pretty well. But I don't actually want to prattle on about the hatred of poetry, about, as Kirsch concludes his review, how we can rediscover what it once was and might be again. As there's already a fairly sturdy industry commercial and anecdotal devoted to this worry. I live in a Midwestern college town where once a month, the line into the poetry slam at a bar actually wraps around the block and inside all variety of people share their poems to an audience of a couple hundred. And a few weeks back, I took a cab to Indy and my driver told me that she reads her poems at various open mics two or three times a week. And last week, also in my town, the poet laureate Juan Felipe Herrera drew an audience of about 600 people. Not to mention, pretty much every wedding and funeral I've ever been to has included a poem. Requires one. So truth be told, I give almost nary a shit about the hatred of poetry, given the abundant and diverse and daily evidence to the contrary. Yesterday, I visited a class of about 25 students at Laverne University in California. I read a few poems and we had an engaged and thoughtful discussion. And as we were heading out to get some food at a Greek place, a young person asked me if I knew the movie House Party. It had been a long time, I told, I said, but yes. And if this person was white, I'd have been kind of nervous for what was coming next. You remind me so much of Kid from Kid and Play without the high top fade. <laughs> but they weren't. And anyway, they weren't talking about me. They were talking about my poems, which they said reminded them of the dancing in the movie. Well, no fucking duh. This is the best review I will probably ever get. Which, if you don't understand the review or my love of it and my great and abiding love of the literary critic who offered it, it's only because you probably never spent something like 40 hours a week mastering every variation of the kid and play kickstep to Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rocks, It Takes Two, with your boys Theo, Maurice, and Harley, all of us getting synchronized in front of the big mirror in Maurice's apartment, his mother in the kitchen stirring gravy and shouting, Maori! when we practiced hard enough that the dishes started clanking in preparation for the ninth grade talent show, which didn't have a winner. I agree with the middle school pedagogy, but did in fact have only one act 
after which the stage was rushed. This one is called Hummingbird. Today, as I was walking down Foothill Boulevard to do laundry, the laundromat, one of my delights, not quite the democratic space of the post office or public library, but still delightful. A hummingbird buzzed past me and alighted in a mostly dead tree, poking almost up to the power line. The bird sat on the spindly branch that bounced in the breeze, twisting its head this way and that, but pretty much just stood still, looking out over the traffic jam on the far side of the street, not moving even as I got directly beneath it. I've never seen one sitting still like that for so long in the open. Although Stephanie thinks the hummingbird might be my totem animal, given how sometimes they seem to follow me around. While I'm writing this, sitting on the curb outside the laundromat, a young woman walk, walked by wearing a winter cat hat with pointy ears, walking a mini Doberman pincher wearing matching pink booties, skittering across, skittering across the asphalt. I swear to you. Once I saw a hummingbird perusing the red impatience at my, outside my building at school, and I walked slowly over to the planting, plucked one, and held it in my outstretched hand, perfectly still, long enough that at least one student walking my way crossed the street so as not to get too close to me, until the blur of light did in fact dip its face into the meager sweet in my hand. And another time I was visiting with a woman I'd met at a reading in Berkeley who wanted to show me her garden. That's not a euphemism, her actual garden. After we walked through the actual garden, admiring the fruit trees and herbs and busy beehives, we sat down on the deck overlooking it all. And she got around to telling me about a friend of hers whose husband was ill and encouraged her to take other lovers if she wanted, which she did, want and take. How's it going for her? I asked. And before my host could respond, a hummingbird buzzed by, almost ruffling her long gray hair, and dipped its beak neck deep into the honeysuckle just behind my new friend's head, its wings almost moaning, the sound of slurping nearly audible as the bird eased its head in and out of the flower, at which she said, nodding, I think it's going all right. This one is, um, it's called, That's Some Bambi Shit. <laughs> That's Some Bambi Shit. Quoth my buddy Pat, when I told him, when I told him about the guy who told me and Stephanie as we were walking the dog around the cemetery, our cat Daisy following behind. Disney shit, yes, but not yet the Bambi shit. As he was pushing his lawnmower, a hefty belly hanging over his belt wrapped tight in a three-quarter sleeve ACDC shirt, camo hat with the gas station razor blade shades perched atop the rim, the brim, when somehow the family of deer in the neighborhood came up in conversation. That not only had he seen them, he'd become friends with them, such that sometimes he'd be working in his shed, getting his mower tuned up, grabbing a tool, and the little fawn would come right in and rub up against him like a big old dog, really, until I'd have to shove him out. Get now, get. And one time I was working back there and started getting lightheaded. And I, and I didn't know I had the sugar, but I started feeling real bad, real dizzy, and started walking out of the shed and toward the house. And the next thing you know, I woke up with both of those deer, the mama and her baby, licking my face all over my cheeks and eyes till I realized I'd passed out and said, okay, okay, that's enough now. And I got up and got me some pop. This is called coffee without the saucer. It might be what one calls a fetish, though don't get excited for there are no feet or other body parts involved. Rather, I want to extol the virtues of the small coffee drink, espresso, short Americano, cortado, served without the saucer. I'm thinking of this delight 
as I wobble across this Greenwich Village cafe called Stumptown, my short Americano wobbling precariously on the little saucer until I can rescue it and place it squarely on the table. Phew. And the spoon clanging the whole time for Pete's sake. The most recent delightful experience of a saucerless administration of a small coffee drink happened at an espresso place I love not only for the very fine small coffee drinks they make, but also for the curiosity of one barista in particular who studies my face as I indulge. No saucer, right? She observed after one visit. I love her. But it's her compatriot I'm today lauding, a French looking college kid. French looking, indulge my stupidity here, by the high-waisted pants and sort of orderly disordered look, a scarf, no beret. When she opened her mouth though, it was obvious that if she was from Bayonne, it was the one in Jersey. Anyway, she pulled the double espresso and without even reaching, without even glancing, beneath the counter where the useless and actually truly dangerous saucers are stacked, think of the natural resources wasted in their produ production, little discuses of evil. She just placed the demi tasse, holding it not by the handle, but sort of clutching it from above, like the magical mechanical claw in those rest stop games, in front of me, all French-like pretending she wasn't my sister, which she was. Um, this is called Umbrella in the Cafe. I'm on my way to New Brunswick for a reading. Where was I going? Going to Rutgers. I'm on my way to New Brunswick for a reading and decided to stop in Jersey City at a bakery on Jersey Avenue called Chaco Pan with croissants and quiche that smelled so good as I walked in this morning, I closed my eyes and reached out like I was falling. This place is kitty corner to a place called Nicole's, a West Indian joint where they have the best roti I've ever eaten. And when I stopped in yesterday on my way into New York to get one, the owner, Nicole, said to me, I was just thinking about you on Sunday. Had she not added Sunday, the cynic in me might have thought she was just being a good business person. But that Sunday made it precise and kind of holy. Like maybe she was praying for me. And however it was, I flitted through Nicole's mind, a little butterfly, a little flutter by. Delights me, given as the cancer, given the cancer she has been afflicted with these past several years. How beautiful and dark she looked. Like maybe she'd gone home for a few weeks, I wonder. In the bakery, let me interrupt myself to acknowledge how often thus far in my journey of delight, a food or food type establishment and experience is the occasion of a delight, that it might in fact form a kind of atlas or map of delights, which is a very good idea for a book, perhaps a companion book to this one, The Map of Delights. I was sitting here reading C.D. Wright's last book, which I love and mourn its being the last one, forever the last one. And where I am sitting with my legs crossed, I am long-leggedly tall, and sometimes it's a puzzle where to put my leg. My right foot, in a now very large seeming red sneaker, is in the path of every person who walks in the door and out the door, which makes for a lanky and regular semi-distraction from the page. The proximity, the negotiation, the closeness also means many contacts again and again as I bob my big red foot down, but briefly, so as not to catch a cramp in my hamstring or calf, which would be dangerous. A guy on his way out, after buying his Americano and scooting by my big red bobbing foot and smiling softly at me and me at him, looked at the drizzle through the big plate glass window, put his coffee down, opened his umbrella, put it over his head, picked up his coffee, then realized, I presume, that he was still inside this bakery. The window was very clean. I saw him giggle to himself, realizing, I think, what he had done. Let me interrupt myself to mention 
that a man with a sack of some sort slung over his shoulder just entered Chapopan and exclaimed, good morning, Jersey City family. And so he lowered his umbrella and walked quickly out with a smirk that today I read as a smirk of gentleness, of self-forgiveness. Do you ever think of yourself late to your meeting or peed your pants some or sent the private email to the group or burned the soup or ordered your cortado with your fly down or snot on your face or opened your umbrella in the bakery as the cutest little thing? And I'm gonna read one more, just one more. This one is called Coco Baby. I caught sight of myself this morning in the mirror applying coconut oil to my body. I was bent over with one foot on the edge of the tub, rubbing the oil onto my calves, which had become a particularly ashen part of my body, particularly visibly ashen as it's summer, which I'm trying to address with a loofah and the oil, abundantly applied. If you want to get way further into this, and I think you do, I recommend Simone White's essay, Lotion, in her book of being dispersed. This time of year, I'm mostly brown, except for the stretch from my waist to my mid thighs, which is a lighter shade, neither of them to be compared to a food or a coffee drink. With my leg up like this, bent over, my testicles swaying just beneath my pale thigh, I wondered if, Whenever I am in this position, which is often oiling, cutting toenails, I will always think of Toy Derricotte's, the poet Toy Derricotte's poem in The Undertaker's Daughter, where as a child, she walks in on her abusive father standing more or less just like this, though he's shaving. Seeing his testicles dangling like that, she thinks they are his udders, the female part he hid, something soft and unprotected I shouldn't see, she writes. I watched myself rub the oil liberally on my body while I was still wet, which my dear friend recently taught me keep some of the moisture in. I got my calves, then my feet, lacing my fingers into my toes. When doing this, I often recall another friend who watching me put lotion on my feet one day smiled and said, good job. Up to my thighs, inner and outer, around to my ass, which seems to want to break out some when I'm sitting too much. Then I get both my arms and shoulders, my chest and stomach, and what I can reach of my back. Usually I oil my face with the residual oil on my hands, and I finish by oiling my penis. Not always last, but often, which I wouldn't read too much into, one way or the other. Today, when I wash myself, particularly when I was oiling my chest and stomach, which I do kind of by self-hugging, I was thinking how many bodies of mine are in this body? This nearly 47 year old body stationed on this plane for the briefest. I could see as I always can, probably kind of dysmorphically, my biggest body when it was 260 pounds and a battering ram and felt sort of impervious. I could also see my 12 year old self, chubby and gangly and ashamed. And of course the baby me, who I don't remember being, though I have seen pictures. When you watch yourself in the mirror, oiling yourself like this, wrapping your arms around yourself, jostling yourself a little, it is easy or easier to see yourself as a child and maybe even a child you really love. It is easy if you decide it, which might be hard, to let the oiling be of the baby you. Or at least I thought so today, looking at myself, whom I am so often not nice to. But the baby you, you oil until he shines. Thank you. Ross, let me begin by uh, echoing the comment in the chat, how delightful it is to, uh, to watch you read, uh, you know, what uh, your smile, your wit, your wisdom uh, really comes through. Uh, you know, I remember the essay 
where you were uh, reflecting on the physicality of uh, poetry readings and the gesticulations and uh, the, the movements and the connections with uh, the folks that you're reading to. And I was wondering about how that would translate into this uh, virtual forum. Uh, but again, as the uh, commenter noted, it, uh, it clearly comes through. And uh, so uh, we would love to have you here in person, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to, to see and hear you uh, read the work. Words. So thanks very much. And before we get into our conversation, let me just quickly echo Lindsay in uh, thanking all of the folks that were involved in uh, making today's happening happen. So uh, again, thanks to uh, the Maryland Humanities uh, for bringing together uh, communities and people across the state uh, to share in uh, you know this uh, tremendous experience of uh, of uh, learning and being in dialogue with one another, and again thanks to the Center for Literary Arts and uh, in particular Jen Brown here at Frostburg State University who worked with Maryland Humanities and all of our local sponsors to make it happen. So uh, my gratitude to all of you. I really appreciate uh, everything that's gone into uh, this event and uh, the program that it's a part of. So, so maybe Ross, let me uh, start up uh, with your last essay there and, and maybe the, uh, the mirror um, uh, metaphor. Um, you know, you note as uh, the project progresses that there are certain patterns that begin to emerge uh, regarding the things that, uh, the kinds of things, and again, the emphasis on that word kind, uh, the kind of things, that uh, you find yourself uh, taking pleasure in. So, of course, as Lindsay indicated in the introduction, um, nature is uh, is probably the uh, the most uh, predominant theme. Um, in addition to that, as as, as uh, you noted in one of the other essays you read, uh, food and beverages, the sensual delights, uh, and uh, you you know you propose that that might also serve as an atlas of of delight. Um, Music, of course, right? Your uh, one of your essays uh, referenced it takes two, and uh, you know uh, eclectic musical tastes popping up throughout the essays, and of course the um, the simple acts of kindness uh, between people. Again, whether it uh, manifests itself verbally in uh, someone calling you "hun" or "baby." or uh, a, a physical gesture, a, a physical connection, a tap on the shoulder or a hug, or, or again, just locking eyes with somebody, uh, uh, a stranger that might be passing by. And of course, the book is populated uh, with uh, family and friends and, and strangers as well. You know, so when you think about those patterns uh, that, that emerged, and uh, again, if that's sort of the mirror uh, was there anything surprising that you found in uh, what was reflected there, or, or, or did you say, "Yeah, this, this is this is me, and this is what I would have expected to see"? So, are there any kinds of things, or any particular things, that you discovered yourself taking delight in that, that came as a surprise to you? You know, I one thing that it's not it it wasn't exactly a surprise that it that it um, that I took delight in, but I. But I don't know that I had noticed before how much, how much I was in fact sort of moved um, by and delighted by exactly that sort of um, simple, almost invisible instances of care between people, you know. So, or you know, just like sometimes it'd be kind of you know extra fun, like you know, people on the airplane, like not being able to not like scoop up a little baby running down the aisle, you know. Um, and sometimes it would be, you know, like um, um, the daily thing of like two people carrying a bag together, you know, a bag that either one of them probably could have carried by themselves or, and then there are, you know, it's funny because I think of like other delights that were drafted but didn't make it into the book. And um, so often what I, realized was that my my what I was sort of witnessing as a delight would be yeah these sort of these little instances of care that that go unnoticed but that are sort of constant um and that like I said it didn't surprise me that it 
it didn't surprise me, but it was interesting kind of to witness, you know, to see it for sure. Yeah, you, you seem disposed to see the good in the world and in people. So, you, you know, that uh, natural inclination towards caretaking that you talk about. Um, I think in one of the essays you say, our nature is to communicate the beautiful. Um, you know, uh, you talk you talk about uh, innocence as is, uh, is, is, is a notion that that pops up a number of times. Um, and in your um, in your uh, your bindweed essay, you 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 say, "Boy, I'm coming close to a sort of cloying glass <laughs> half full uh, perspective." So you seem to have a pretty optimistic. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, sense of, of human nature and, and, and our condition. Um, you know, one, is that true? Is that uh, kind of how you see the world? And, and, and two, you know, have the circumstances, like you said at the, the beginning, right, you were writing back in 2016, um, you know, have the circumstances of the past 18 months um, you know, changed your perspective in any way, you know, so as we've gone through the pandemic and, uh, you know, seen uh, all, all, all of the, 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 the um, you know, uh, things that have come of that. And, and as we note, really the disparate impact of the pandemic on, on different populations of people. And, and, and again, last summer, uh, the, the killing of George Floyd and, and uh, you know, others that, um, you know, have really pointed up uh, the very deep uh, inequities and injustices in our society. So again, I guess, you know, positive spin on things and has that perspective changed with circumstances over the past year and a half? Um, yeah, the perspective has not changed at all. And, and, it, and it, um, it feels like it's a sort of, um, in certain ways, it's just sort of um, becoming further clarified or, or further, you know, almost articulated in the midst of things. Um, and, and the other thing that I think is important to note is that I, um, I don't think I'm actually inclined this way <laughs> or not totally, you know, in part, um, in part, you know, like, you know, my, my therapist, I don't know exactly how he put it, but he more or less at some point was like, oh, okay. Like you kind of have a fundamental distrust. Hmm. And so, so I think that's something that's really important about this. Um, and it was a people of people. I think one of the things that is important about this book and I, and I, and I, sometimes I forget that, which, and when he said that, and it was in the midst of while I was writing this book, <laughs> when he said that I just cracked up because I was like, ah, that's part of why I'm writing this book because it is a practice of witnessing, it is a practice of witness actually, you know, training myself to witness um, how it is in fact that we care for one another, um, which is constant, which is ubiquitous. Um, but, but, you know, it could, it's not always easy to remember. And I, so that, that feels like, you know, and when I talk about this, um, this project as a, you know, sometimes it's, I think of discipline, but I, but I like the word practice. And, and again, I've said this a few times in the previous readings, but I think of, I think of Alan Iverson when I say the word practice, I think of like a kind of theory of practice that means it's daily, it's always happening. You may not see it um, while it's happening, but it's happening. Um, and that the practice itself generates, the practice itself generates more of what it is that it's studying. Mm -hmm. So when we study what it is that we love, the belief is that the practice itself will generate more love, you know? And so that, you know, that's kind of like, that's my, that's my gamble, you know? Yeah, 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 that's, you, you know, in, in, in addition to, uh, you know, all of the positivity that's, uh, that's, that's cataloged and captured in the book too, there, there are also reflections on the relationship between delight and sorrow and delight and terror. 
Um, and, you know, there, there is in the background, it seems, you know, this uh, uh, recurrent thought about loss and sorrow and uh, mortality. Uh, you know, I think you talk about existential anxiety in some places too. So could you talk a little bit about you know those those kinds of uh, those kinds of experiences in the background and how you see their relationship between uh, those and, and delight. Yeah, you know, there's um, it's funny because I'm I'm writing a um, a book right now that's ostensibly about I don't know what it's called yet, but it's sort of um, you know over the last five, six, seven years I've had the excuse me the occasion I've been lucky enough to. You know, because the book before this is called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, book of poems. And, and in a way that book sort of starts for me, uh, like a, maybe like, although maybe I didn't know it exactly, a kind of deep meditation on this idea of joy, you know, and which I learned from people responding to it, saying things like, oh, I didn't know you could write about joy, you know. And then with the Book of Delights, that kind of obviously deepens or you know, adds to that, that conversation or maybe solidifies the question and um, it's something that I'm thinking about. So, but anyway, I've been thinking a lot about, so now I'm working on this book that's a little bit more explicitly toward a kind of deeper you know, wondering about, in the midst of a deeper wondering about joy. Um, I'm not trying to define it. I'm not trying to like pin anything down. I think I'm trying to point at stuff. And one of the things that um, I return to again and again, as I think about it, is that it seems to me that among the things that joy might be is the fundamental understanding, not only of sorrow, but of um, not only of sorrow and brutality and all that, but also of just the plain fact that we, um, I think I have the quote right, as uh, Beckett says in Waiting for Godot, I mean, one Vladimir uh, Estragon, one of the main characters says, um, we're born astride a grave. And with that understanding, <laughs> what, then, what then constitute reasonable practices? <laughs> mm -hmm. in, my, in my estimation, it seems like, oh, okay, we need to care for each other in the midst of that. You know, we need to figure that out. That that's that you know we're not getting out of that, and we need to figure that out together. And the yeah. moments of like tending to one another in the midst of that, um, the luminous sort of gathering in the midst of that, um, to me feels like um, something like joy. And it never at all, you know, joy to me, you know, does not. Um, does not, you know, I'm kind of like, when I have a, there's an essay in here in the delights called joy is such human madness. And it's kind of riffing on this Sadie Smith essay. It doesn't at all negate or diminish or try to distance itself from profound sorrow. In fact, it, joy itself, you know, and I, I kind of follow Sadie Smith on this. It, it doesn't, it's not discreet from sorrow it's um, mutually constitutive. It's all, the fact that we're all woven together is, is both a, a kind of, you know, um, is both sorrowful in the most, is sorrowful in the most wondrous way, you know, mm -hmm. in the most wonderful way. That's sort of what I, what I think. So anyway, that's exactly right. Like, so it, you know, in one's daily life, and that's what this is, it's a kind of daily thing. I'm not actually trying just to be like, you know, I really love uh, bobblehead dolls or I really love, you know, flowers. I'm really like flowers, a garden is a place where we get to witness birth and death and change and, you know, and interconnectedness and interdependence and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So you say delight. And I think in one place you say delight is um, delight is not universal. But, yeah. but again, it sounds like, you know, there is a foundation underneath of that that you're suggesting this. There are these universal elements to the human condition that, 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 that lead us in that direction. So, so maybe, maybe thinking a little bit then about, you know, the subjectivity of delight, right? Uh, and, and, and again, the, the subjective point of view that you occupy and, and approach it from. So you're uh, a Black male in a market society. And I think, uh, you know, all of those features 
uh, you know, our, our, our um, cause for reflection on your part about uh, how you delight in things. So, so maybe the first element, uh, you know, I, I, I um, you know, really appreciated the sort of, uh, you know, meta delight that you take as a black person writing a book of delights mm -hmm. and how that uh, stands very much in contrast to the commodification of suffering uh, among black people in our society. And then you even have the nice textual element in that essay bringing together, right? Uh, suggesting the conflation of blackness and suffering. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, that and how it informs your thinking about delight. Yeah, you know, in a way it's sort of like, it is the commodification of <clears throat> suffering of, of the dominant cult. I would say suffering, the, the commodification of black suffering is, um, is a kind of um, product of white supremacy or, and capitalism and, and all of that. Um, the, and in, in a way in that essay, I'm sort of, I'm sort of, you know, speculating or positing, or, you know, I think it's the case that, um, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a way in which making profound brutality appear to be systemic, profound systemic brutality appear to be natural. There, that serves a purpose. That serves a purpose to um, to a brutal culture, you know. Um, and 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 one of the things that again I'll sort of talk about this next book is there's a um, there's an essay in there that sort of responds to the idea that um, that something like delight or something like joy, and periodically I will I will receive this or like receive it from you know secondhand sources that. That it's not serious, you know, and it's not um, it's not rigorous, and and uh, you know, almost um, you know, like what you know, how could you be doing that at a time? <laughs> how could you think be thinking about what you love at a time like this? Which to me is just the stupidest fucking question in the world. <laughs> of course, you know, because it's like that's what we got to think about. That's what we got to study. We study what we love, you know. We study and and make and share what we love. We note what we love. We study it. We share it. Um, not what is brutal and what we do not want to, you know, maintain. You know, and thinking about you know the university is kind of an interesting thing that um, that you know you can find a hell of a lot more classes about like miserable shit studies then you can like, this will keep you alive, studies. <laughs> this will make you glad, <laughs> study. You know, that's like, that's not, and basically, so my, my, my take on it is that joy, and again, joy as a kind of grave, the word grave, which I use very, you know, pointedly, um, subject, is the worthy, is the worthy subject of our most serious, rigorous, sustained, beloved contemplation, you know, it is the most worthy subject of our contemplation, because really it is, um, it's, you know, it's in the kind of uh, framework of also how we love each other, you know, how we care for each other. That's my two cents. That's yeah. a great question. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, of course. So, so, so let, let me maybe uh, begin to turn to the question so we can uh, share the conversation here. Uh, um, okay, so so uh, so I think right, uh, you know, uh, Sa Sally's sharing uh, something that uh, right. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people share their delights with you uh, <laughs> during these seminars, uh, um, and uh, she shares an undelight, which uh, had turned into a delight. Her windshield wipers were out of sync, and uh, she <laughs> did not care for that. <laughs> So is that is that the case? I suppose uh, I suppose uh, you, you know you are you are the delight guy uh, <laughs> now, and uh, yeah, th th there must be a lot of sharing. Are, are there are there any that uh, folks have shared with you that uh, are particularly memorable? Oh God, I mean that's a really good one. I love that. So often it's like the thing that um, 
um, the, like today I was walking down um, and I was, <laughs> I was walking to my little studio here. I live a couple blocks away. And I was, um, I was like um, doing a rinse with coconut oil in my mouth. I, I was, you know, just <laughs> walking quietly to myself. <laughs> um, and someone, I, I just kind of walked around the corner and the person whose garden I was walking through effectively, the sidewalk goes through their garden, um, was like, hey, what's going on? And I, <laughs> my intention was to spit it out, <laughs> but I felt a little bit shy to spit it out in the garden. So I saw, <laughs> this is like a way to care for your teeth. It's not, you know, kind of rich coconut oil, but you got to do it for like 10 or 15 minutes. And anyway, I, and I swallowed all this coconut oil. <laughs> And I was like, it was so disgusting <laughs> in a way. But it was also like hilarious. It was just, yeah. it was amazing. It was a kind of delight that made me think about all these other things. Yeah, I yeah. Get, I'm delighted. Yeah, I get that. I get that often, you know. Um, I can't think of any right now, but I love that that person shared it with me. And I, I also tell you that it is such a nice thing that people, because of this book, it is such a nice thing that because I wrote a book that's, you know, trying to study delight. That some people are inclined to be like, "Hey, this is something wonderful that happened to me." That's that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. Yeah. So, so freedom is uh, saying, um, "I did not realize how many things I find delightful until I read your book." I'm now planning a curriculum to teach third and fifth graders about childhood delights from the 19th through 21st centuries. And I hope they too learn new delights and whoop whoop from another Jerseyan. Ah, so a shout out from Jersey. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, there, there is, you know, something sort of paradoxical. And again, you've been speaking to this in it that, um, you know, that, that we have to, uh, be so intentional about recognizing the things that delight us. You know, you 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 would think that that of all things would not go unobserved, um, but it uh, seems so much passes by us, and 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 unless we're we're we're, we're being very intentional and in, in looking for it, it 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 just passes right by us. Which again seems a very odd thing. How can delight pass by us unnoticed? Yeah. I know it. It's so true. And there is a thing I was sort of thinking about over the course of this week, like this, this week has been so useful for me because I've had opportunity to kind of, and these Q and A's are always like times for me to sort of like get closer to my thoughts um, or to like learn things, you know, learn maybe what I might think from you all. And I, I realized in the course, something made me realize, oh, right. One of the things that that noting something that delight you, delights you, one of the things that it does for you is that it lets you know, now you know that thing delights me. So, mm -hmm. you know, like I was walking down the other day and I saw like, um, I saw this little like kind of weird flower pot that had like one of these flowers that kind of, like a plastic little toy flower pot in a window. <laughs> I just love those things, I love them. But I don't always know, I, I didn't, I had to note that I loved it, you know? And the fact that now I note it and I walk by the house on my way here of the person who has two of them, of those little things, it just makes me, I could be in my mind, like kind of going over whatever and not sort of attending to my delights. And to walk by that thing and be like, oh, that, oh yeah, there's a thing, that thing delights me, you know? You and have more of those in your life, it's kind of magic. Yeah. Did your family or close friends get to read any of your delights before publication? And if so, did they have feedback that helped you choose which one made which ones made it into the book? Yeah, for sure. You know, like I am. Um, <laughs> if you're in my proximity while I'm working on a book, you very well may be subjected to some sentences, you know, and it's it's just like, <laughs> it, you know, they deserve like, you know, if I ever get a check from from these things, like they deserve, like they deserve either, you know, they deserve some pizza, you know, because that's just one of the things that I do. Like I always share. So like literally I'd see friends like on the street and someone I remember <laughs> my friend Lisa Marie was like having a bad day. And I was like, oh, I got something for you. <laughs> 
So I read her like two delights, you know, and or on and on and on and on. So that's all to say that, yes, I am a, a regular and rampant sharer, um, adamant sharer of these things. And yeah, like totally, I have readers, people who read, um, for me, several people who read my work like very closely, in addition to a, an excellent editor um, at Algonquin, but beloved friends who read my work um, and folks who like maybe aren't like regular readers who um, who will read stuff or at a reading, I can kind of listen to how a reading can be going um, from an audience with this, with that, with the book that you all are reading for sure. Cause I was still touring at that time. And um, so it's very much informed by, by other people. There's also other people who are not, I may not ask their opinion, but whose voices and uh, consideration I'm always in the midst of. And one of the most beautiful things about this book is that like there are moments of humor that feel very particular to me. There are things that only I am gonna think is, is are funny. But the thing is, that's not true. And there's one other person in the world who thinks they're funny. And I realized that when I read in Harrisburg and my brother was there and I heard, and he has a loud laugh like me, and I would read stuff and the only person in the audience who would laugh <laughs> would be my brother. <laughs> So it helped me realize I'm so tuned to my brother, you know, in, in a lot of the things that I think and think about. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Nina is uh, saying, just as you noted that a lot of your delights take place in coffee shops, bakeries, and so forth, I was thinking the same thing. I have a friend who once remarked that the first sip of coffee in the morning fills her whole being with love for all humanity. <laughs> Is it that the sensual delights have more, have a, sorry, is, is it that the sensual delights have an expansiveness that embraces so much more? Yeah. Great question. You know, yeah. I love that. I love, like Michael, when you said, the, um, you called them the sensual delights. I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me that that's what, oh, that's what they are. They're sort of like the taste or the smell or the, um, the feeling, the touch of things. I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me. Um, but maybe that is, maybe that is what it is. And it's also like, you know, the sensual, if you think about, even if you don't think about the cup of coffee or you think about the smell of the flower, um, one of the things that you are drawn into very quickly is you're drawn out of yourself actually into something else. And part of that something else, maybe part of what the delight is that in a way you become, you know, unself-possessed. You become in a way um, beheld by something that is not you. you. You become something else and that you join, you know, and that, that is important. I think that is a real thing, you know, that when you, when you are admiring or you're touching the bark of a, of a, of a birch tree, you know, or a beech tree, you know, the unbelievable sort of silvery like silken bark almost you your your mind becomes that tree becomes your mind and you become that tree in a, in a very real way and I think there's something about that that is um again it's connected to joy for for sure but though I hadn't quite thought of it how how we're talking about it before that question yeah so, so a delight we can all share in, um, uh, so, so someone is uh, letting us know that the closed captioning function on Zoom is spelling poems as palms. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that was a terrific story. And uh, that, that punchline at the end was a... Uh, was a was was a great one. Uh, good, good. That's yeah. amazing. I can't believe that. That might be a that might be a delight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of encouragement coming through. Uh, you, you know, uh, somebody the, the the map of delights sounds like a, a terrific idea to pursue. So I think in the conversation before we got started, Ross, you, you're you're continuing. You're you're continuing the exercise. You're continuing the project. Yeah, I started kind of just doing another one, um, another book of delights that I'm just sort of calling book two. Um, uh, I started at August 1st, my birthday. And it's been five years since I started the last one. And I, I kind of see that, you know, I, after I wrote it, 
the first one, I was sort of, <clears throat> one, I was kind of like, I could do this for the rest of my life. That would be a reasonable and I think useful project. Um, but I had other projects to do. And I also kind of set myself the year long thing to do. Um, probably also needed to turn something in. That might've been the case. But I, I, I do like, I'm very interested in like long projects, like projects that just kind of go on, you know, like, um, you know, I think of some poets, I actually think of it in, in terms of poets, like Nate Mackey writes, writes kind of things that are just going on or Ann Waldman. Um, it's a kind of experimental poetic pro project, I think. Um, but then like one of the essayists whose work I love, like I always say Montaigne, but maybe you say Montagna, um, just piled up essays forever. You know, I'm looking at his book over there. It's like 10 zillion essays. And it's sort of like, okay, I'm just gonna do this forever. I'm, I like that idea. And I like the idea of, you know, given that I do have other projects that are kind of like different than this, to be like, okay, well, let's maybe every five years do a book of delights and, you know, see what happens. Yeah. So anyway, that's all to say that, yeah, I'm about two months and change into this book too. Okay, excellent, excellent. So again, getting getting some uh, some feedback. Uh, again, the the readings, uh, you know, seem to have been uh, favorites of, of a number of people. So uh, again, I, I I don't know, you know, as uh, uh, you know, in, in in this forum, right? Uh, we got to hear and see you. Unfortunately, you didn't get to hear all of the laughing and smile and see all the smiling that uh, you know folks are clearly indicating was going on on the audience side. So uh, you, know, you know a lot of good stuff coming in in that way. Um, uh, you, you know some lessons learned, right? Uh, you know uh, Sally wants for Christmas a handheld hummingbird feeder. Uh, if you think you want one, I hope it's not janky or panty wasted. Two new words I learned while reading your book. So <laughs> you're expanding the vocabulary of uh, of uh, folks here in Western Maryland. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, maybe, maybe uh, one 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 final question I had, Ross, was uh, you know thinking about memory. Uh, you know, memories, uh, oftentimes things that you're seeing or experiencing seem to be uh, memory prompts. And uh, oft often you're, um, uh, you, you know, uh, there's, there's the delight in the memory itself. But, um, you know, I think it's uh, the essay with uh, your father taking you and your brother to, uh, to watch fireflies light up the sky. And you wonder if it was a, 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 a real memory, right? Um, and, and, and I guess that's what, you know, the, the, the psychologists are telling us these days, you know, sort of our folk understanding of memory is we kind of think it's like a VCR or a, a you know, recording. We just go back and see it for what it was. Yeah. But in fact, we do an awful lot of editing and uh, yeah, do you, you know, how do you think about memories when you, when you, when you write about those? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm, I'm thinking more and more about them. I'm actually like, kind of working on an essay where my father, you know, my father shows up a lot and, and it's all, it's so, it's, it's all memory, you know, um, and it's memory that's not, I'm not able to necessarily corroborate everything, you know, plenty. I can kind of be like, to my mom, my brother, like that happened like this, blah, blah, blah. but some of it, um, I just, it's, you know, me and my old man, like, you know, going to get pizza or something. And, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to being an adult and also um, being an adult in the life of kids, uh, well, you know, people who are my partner's kids and watching the way, watching the way we kind of experience the world, um, which is complicated and, you know, no two people experience it the same way. Um, and furthermore, for whatever reason, there are times when um, I know it in my own experience that we make a memory or we make an experience um, and it's a corner of the experience and there was all this other part of the experience. Um, and in a way, what I'm trying to do is um, make room for that, the kind of fluidity 
of recall or the, the possibility, a more expansive understanding of like what could have happened. Maybe particularly when I'm, when I'm thinking of things that, like if I'm talking about my dad, like um, implied always is like, man, I would love to ask you about this. You know, mm -hmm. I'd love to ask you about this, you know, and we could work out a memory together, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's a great question. Yeah, I love that. Well, thanks uh, for a, a terrific conversation. Again, uh, really wonderful reading. Thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. And I'm sure I speak for everybody uh, that uh, is on this end. Uh, really, really a great pleasure to, to spend some time with you today and to read the book. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who made this event possible. It was a great conversation a great way to end the tour. I, I have to say, Ross, my only regret is that I didn't get to have a long conversation with you. Listening in on all of these, I was like, oh, man, these moderators are so lucky. So thank you, um, Dr. Matthias, for, for joining us. Um, thank you, Ross, again, for the whole tour. Thanks again to our co-host, Frostburg State University, our local partners. Um, everyone, be sure to pick up a copy of the Book of Delights at your local books or a library if you haven't already. And if you could take a few moments to fill out our survey that would offer feedback, that would be great. There should be a link in the chat. And thank you everyone, have a great rest of your day.